So this video is the fourth day looking at electrostatics. We're at the halfway point and we're going to see a bit of a departure from the work we were doing with forces and with fields as we move into looking at energy and voltage, uh, kind of the complementary second half to electrostatics. We're actually going to start off today by taking a little moment to review what we know about gravity energy because that's going to be super helpful for us when we go to think about electric potential energy. So I've got a picture here where I have um, a couple of masses. Mass number one is going to be the Earth, so it's nice and big and it got there first. And then mass number two is going to be this little movable mass that we can move around. It can actually be either really close to the Earth or it can actually be uh, nice, and, nice and far from the Earth. And the whole idea with gravity is I want to start here because this is something that we already know. So if we can just kind of talk about that a little bit again, then we'll be more comfortable looking at the new material. And so in our unit on gravity, we saw this equation for potential energy. And it looked kind of like force, but it wasn't. It's actually a calculus thing. It's called an antiderivative. And it was g m1, m2, all divided by just a single r. And the way that equation worked is we would have to be measuring how far these masses are apart, measured center to center. And so we would measure them like that and say, okay, that's how far they are apart. And there was, if we were all the way out at infinity, there was a place where we could say there was zero energy. So I'm going to put that in over here. So EP potential energy is zero here. Okay, we said that that was the place where R was equal to infinity. You're infinitely far from the Earth. That's the only time you can get up to zero. Anything short of that, and you're actually in negative energy. And that's what this negative sign, which comes from the calculus, that negative sign is going to tell us that when you go and check out the amount of energy, the amount of potential energy that this mass has got when it's close to the Earth, like say right here, then you're going to have negative energy there. And that just tells you that it's less than that zero energy when we were all the way infinitely far away. Okay, so that mass, it's attracted to the Earth, and that means that if you were to walk it from infinitely far away to the Earth, it would actually, it would tend to fall that way, and it would actually be a very easy walk. In fact, you'd be pulling it back, kind of like taking a dog for a walk where the dog knows there's some treat at the end, the dog would be pulling you, especially at the end when it's close to the treat, um, to try to take the mass from close to the earth and then move it far from the earth is like trying to take a dog away from a treat. It would actually be really, really tough to do that. So that's the story with gravity. Now let's take a look and see how that's kind of the same and kind of different for electrostatics. So electrostatics, when we look at the energy here, this is new. Okay, We haven't touched on this yet but it's still gonna be sort of the same idea. But there's a catch. It turns out you could be playing with two positive charges, two negatives, or you can mix and match. So let's kind of label everything here. Let's say this is kind of like where the Earth was. That's Q1. And this other Q, it might be here, or maybe it might be farther away, it might be over there. If we can get all the way infinitely far away, then we'll still say that the potential energy is zero there. Okay, so that would be at r is equal to infinity, infinitely far from the Earth. Well, we want to focus on the story where you're not infinitely far from the Earth. What if you took a tape measure and measure the distance when these charges are fairly close together, maybe only a few meters apart, definitely not infinitely far away. Now, I wanted to do the gravity story first because you're going to see that the equation is pretty much the same thing. So you'd, you'd kind of be expecting that maybe it would look like this. You know, maybe there would be a minus sign and then a different constant because it's electricity, maybe the K instead of the G, and then the Q1 and the Q2 instead of the Ms because we're talking about electricity, not mass, and then divided by the R. That's what you would expect. But it turns out that's not quite right. And the reason is... When these two positives are very close together, they repel each other, and it would actually be a lot of effort to get them that close together. Unlike the, the gravity story where the masses easily go together and it's hard to get them apart. 
the electrostatic story for these two positives is actually the reverse. So we're going to change this. We're actually going to put a positive sign there. And you might be thinking, well, that's great if they're two positives, but what if they're two negatives? Well, this is one time when we're actually going to trust the math. You can, unlike the first half of the chapter, you can totally trust the math with the values for the Q. So that's going to be my little phrase for this half of the chapter. The first half was use your head to try to figure out direction. But here now, we're actually going to go and trust the mathematics with plus or minus signs for the Q values. Okay, so we can totally trust the math there, and it'll actually do a pretty nice job. And here's what I mean by that. If the two Qs that you have are positive, then by putting two positive values in, as long as there is a plus sign here, we're going to get a positive energy, and that makes sense. Two negative charges, that would also generate a positive answer, and that makes sense, because you'd have positive energy in that story. If you mix and match, if one Q was positive and one Q was negative, then they would tend to want to get close to each other, much like the Earth did. And that would be a situation where trusting the math would also work because you'd have a positive and a negative and it would generate a negative sign. So the moral of the story is you already know how to do this. It's just that you have to make sure it's a positive in your equation and not a negative. And then definitely trust the math when you're taking a look at um, putting the values in for the Qs. So in the Earth story, we had negative energy when a mass was close to the Earth. And what we're going to find out now is that here it's the reverse. We're actually going to have positive energy, at least in this story. At this location. Okay, what if it's one of each? What if it's a plus and a minus? Okay, then everything is still totally fine. We're not going to change anything. Right, we're still going to measure no change in the rules here. This is good news. We're still going to say that, you know, maybe Maybe this one is Q1, it got there first, and here's Q2, it's being moved around. And they're attracting each other, kind of like a dog and a treat. You know, they want to get close to each other. So if you walked that Q2 in, it would be easy to walk it in close to Q1. It'd be hard to pull it away. We're still going to play our usual gravity game and say, oh yeah, the potential energy is zero out here. That's the place where mathematically we would say r is equal to infinity and the good news is it's not like we need to come up with a new equation okay so again this this equation will work fantastic we just have to make sure it's a plus sign and then we can go k q1 q2 all divided by just a plain old r we don't want to put any r squareds in there we didn't do that for gravity energy either and so when it's time to put in values for q1 and q2 totally trust the math. If you've got one positive and one negative, go for it. Put in one positive and one negative. And then this equation will actually go and deliver a negative energy for you, which is exactly what we're expecting. Okay, so in this story here, when you have this Q2 that's negative, really close to the Q1, in that situation you would have negative energy, just like with that Earth story. Now, with the Earth story, when we were moving things around, looking at orbits, we were most of the time using conservation of energy, and the same thing is true here. We're going to be using conservation of energy when we move these charges around. We can't just use like F equals MA and, and kinematics because the force values will change. So we're going to go back to our tried and true and trusted conservation of energy equation. And I can tell you that in this chapter there won't be any heat. We won't be rubbing these charges on the carpet on the way in or out. So it's actually down to just five possible terms. And usually we won't even need all five. But there are only five uh, total possible terms here. So for potential energy initially, you're going to find yourself doing one of these calculations where we go K, Q1, Q2, all divided by just an R. And then maybe the charge will have some kinetic energy at the beginning. Maybe it's got a moving start. Okay, great. 
There might be some human, some elf, doing some work to change the story a little bit. And then in the end, we're going to take a look at the positioning of those Qs, and we'll trust the math again on that equation right, with our Q1 and our Q2. And there might be some speed at the end. Maybe this thing has a running finish where it finishes off with some speed. Most of the time, you won't need all five of those terms. Most of the time, it'll just be two or three. Uh, but sometimes we might need all five. So that's the theory for um, for about half of the second half of the chapter. Okay, so about uh, the third quarter of the chapter's theory is done, but we need to get pretty proficient at trying some of these examples out. So I've got a few different ones for us to try. Here's the first one. Got a couple of charges that are fairly close together. Okay, 2.8 picocoulombs and a proton. So they're both positive in this story. Uh, those charges do not like being near each other. Positives repel each other. And the first thing we're going to look at is not actually the force of repulsion, but how much potential energy there is in that arrangement. So I would be going and using this equation that it's kind of new, but it's kind of not. Right? It's very similar to what we would have done for gravity. I'd be using this one here. And absolutely trust the math. So I'm going to put my constant in. And then... If it's a positive 2.8 picocoulombs, then put in a positive 2.8 value. Okay, pico is 10 to the negative 12. And if it's a proton, okay, put in a positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And then we'll divide all of that by how far they are apart. We won't square it, but we do have to write the number in meters. So it's decimal 03. Now, two positives multiplied together gives me a positive answer. And that says that that arrangement was tough to create. To try to shove those things together is going to take some effort. And that's why we're seeing some positive energy in our answer. 1.34, 10 to the negative 19 joules. Okay, now for the follow-up questions, here's where we're going to do some conservation of energy. How much work would it take to bring a proton from really far away to that location? So if you're trying to create that situation up there at the top, how much work was it? How tired are you after you've actually done that? Now, it turns out we've kind of already answered the question just with the work we did in part A, but let's go through the logic of this. We're going to be doing this conservation of energy most of the time now for the second half of the chapter. So we've got our original energies plus some work is equal to the final potential and the final kinetic. That's all the possible things you might need, and we probably don't need them all. So they're asking you, well, how much work would it be? Okay, so I guess I need this term here. Got to find that to bring a proton from very far away to this location. Well, if it starts very far away, okay, so again, that's that time when you're like infinitely far away. Oh, we jokingly said where the aliens lived. Uh, then the potential energy there is zero. So when you put infinity in for that denominator, yeah, you get zero. So we don't even have to put that in whenever things are very far away. It doesn't say that there was a running start, so I'm going to throw that term away too. I'm trying to find the work. There is some potential energy in the end, and it didn't say that I had to have a running finish, so I'm going to throw that term away. And so what I can see is that actually if you're trying to find the work, right, if that's what you're looking for, you've already found the answer. Right? It's just the final potential energy. It's that positive 1.34 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Okay, now another follow-up question. If you hold Q1, so it can't move, it's glued down, and then you just let go of the proton, it's not going to stay there. It's going to try to get out of there like a cat trying to get away from a bathtub. And we're wondering, what would be the final velocity when it's really, really far away? It gets most of its push at the beginning, when it's close and the forces of repulsion are big. But let's just go with conservation of energy. I don't want to try to do F equals MA because as it leaves, that repulsive force would change in size. It would diminish. But conservation of energy is going to work perfectly. So I would do this off the start. And then I'd look at it and go, okay, well, what, what do I need? What do I not need? EPI, is there some potential energy in there at the beginning? Yes, there is. If you're going to let them go from that story where they're three centimeters apart, then at the beginning of the day, they are 1.34 times 10 to the negative 19 joules rich in potential energy. 
kinetic energy? Well, it just says released. It doesn't say chucked, right? We're not going to throw it. We're just going to let it go. So we're going to start from rest. Uh, it doesn't say that somebody is running behind it and pushing it. There's no elf, so we can throw the work term away. And then we're going to end up very far away when we're done. And when you're very far away, when r equals infinity, that's the only time there's no potential energy. And then they want to know how fast would it go. Oh, okay. So it looks like we're just going to convert this potential energy into some kinetic energy. So I would now just put in my good old classic 1 half mv squared. I would go and look up the mass just on the formula sheet. For a proton, it's 1.67, 10 to the negative 27, and then speed squared. And if you actually go through and run the numbers, I think the speed on this one is around 1.3 times 10 to the 4 meters per second. Not that that answer really, really matters. It's the process, the setup, that's the most important thing. The idea that you can not use forces and accelerations unless you're prepared to deal with the fact that the force and acceleration on that proton would diminish as it leaves. And that's a challenging thing to do that basically the, engine, the uh, energy does for you, right? That's what the energy equation does. It deals with the fact that that force is changing. Okay, number two, out of four for the day, number two is actually pretty similar. Two electrons just sitting four meters apart. That, that's not something you'd normally see, right? They, they don't like being near each other. So I'm expecting that there's probably going to be some potential energy in that story. And so I could go and try out this equation. EP is equal to K, Q1, Q2, all over a plain old R, just an R. And so I'd put in my value for k, 9 times 10 to the 9. Now absolutely trust the math here. There's the charge on the first electron. Here's the charge on the next electron. They're both negative. Trust the math. Put that in for both of them. And then they're 4 meters apart. And so two negatives, of course, they're going to multiply and make a positive. And so the math, as we would expect, is saying, hey, there's energy there. Those things don't like being near each other. Um, and they're, they're definitely going to want to try to fly away if you're going to let them go. Part B says, yeah, well, we might let them go in a minute, but how much work, how much effort was it to get them that close? And again, if forces are changing, which they will be in this half of the chapter, then you want to go with conservation of energy. Potential energy initially, kinetic energy initially, the work term, and then the two energies when we're done. Now, in this story, we're going to start really, really far away. That's the only time you can scratch off potential energy. And it doesn't say we have a running start, so I'm going to throw away the original kinetic energy term. And we're looking for work, so I'll keep that. There's definitely potential energy when we're done, but it doesn't say you have to finish with any speed. And so once again, what I can see is that we've basically already found the answer. If we found the potential energy in part A, that's how much work it must have been in order to get those charges really close together. So trust conservation of energy, lay out all five terms, and then start scratching terms off. If it doesn't say it was moving, well, then you can throw away the kinetic energy term either before or after. And if anything is ever very far away, throw away the potential energy term. Part C is almost the same as the last question, except this time they're both going to be released, not just one of them. So they're going to have to share the amount of energy that's there. And so if you think about that equation back from example number one, we would have had potential energy that gets converted into kinetic. Okay, I'm just going to kind of skip to that answer. This is what we said at the end of example number one. Initial potential energy is going to get converted into um, final kinetic energy. But here's the catch. There are two electrons, and they can each have some final kinetic energy. Now, the good news is you don't have to worry about how they're going to go and split that up. It's actually pretty nice. They're both identical. They're electrons. So they are going to, by conservation of momentum, as they explode, they're going to share the energy equally. They're both going to have identical speeds in opposite directions. So I'm going to take half of the potential energy and give it to one of those electrons and then watch what it can do with it. The other electron would take the other half of the potential energy. So here's the amount of potential energy for one electron, one electron's share. And now I'm just going to do some grade 11, 1 half mv squared. 
I would have to look up the mass for an electron. It's a lot less than the mass for a proton and then speed squared. So I just took this equation and I said, oh, okay, well, let's, let's kind of, you know, say, well, don't worry about one kinetic energy and we'll take half the potential. And that sort of you know, intuitively makes a fair bit of sense. And I think if you run the numbers, this ends up being 7.95 meters per second. Okay, just two last questions. And actually, by the time we've done question four, we'll actually be kind of drifting into next day's material a little bit. This question here this talks about trying to create an arrangement, a nice little triangular arrangement where a whole bunch of charges are all set. Well, three of them are sitting really close to each other. And we're going to try to figure out how much work it would be to get them really, really close. We're actually just going to do conservation of energy again. If they all start really, really far away, then we can throw away the potential energy terms at the beginning. And it doesn't say they have a running start. And so we're looking for the work, you know, how much work would it be to get them really close? And they don't have to have a running finish. So I'm going to throw away kinetic energy for all three of those things in the end. And so the work is really just this potential energy that we have in the end. And the potential energy is actually kind of in handshakes between the charges. I'm, I've been a little sloppy here. I call this just E1. It almost looks like electric field. Maybe I should put a little P in there for potential energy right so i want to apologize on behalf of all physicists that we use the same capital e in the uh, in the chapter for two different things but if you put a little p on there then maybe you can remember that it's potential energy okay so there are three handshakes of potential energy it's kind of like three people at a business meeting when they start arriving the first person arrives there's no handshake no energy yet then the second person arrives and there's one handshake and then when the third person arrives there are two more handshakes and so what we're going to do is just add up those three handshakes of energy. And this is the super nice thing about potential energy is you don't have to worry about any directions at all. There's no like, oh, well, it's at a 60 degree angle. There's none of that. You just go through and interaction by interaction, you start looking at the energies. Like, for instance, between the 24 and the negative 2, you could say, okay, negative 2 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs and a 24 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. And that's going to be, uh, what do they say, 8 centimeters apart, so decimal 0, 8 meters away. But then there's another handshake. Then you have to go K. All right, let's go with the negative 2, 10 to the negative 6, and doing a little handshake energy with the 18, 10 to the negative 6. Also, eight centimeters away. And you can just keep on doing this as long as you've counted every single handshake once. So the last one would be a 24, 10 to the negative six. Uh, I gotta move this a little bit here. I just need a little bit more room. There we go. And then the last Q, 18 times 10 to the negative six all over decimal 0, 0.8. And so you would just simply add up, this is the good news, you would simply add up those potential energies to find that total potential energy in the end, which is going to be the work involved. And so you'd be adding up a negative 5.4 joules and a negative 4.05 joules, I'm just trusting the math, and then a 48.6 joules. And in the end, that final amount of work that you'd have to do to get all of that potential energy in the end ends up being 39.2 joules. Okay, so let's talk about what's important about this second to last question. Key thing is that you trust the math, right? If there are negative charges, you put them in and you never worry about direction, okay? There's no issues about, oh, well, what's the angle on this? Energy only cares about how far things are away. So it's actually very, very nice. Now this last one is a little bit of a tougher problem and it's kind of bleeding into next day a little bit, but we'll give it a shot here now. Uh, we've got uh, charge 3.6 microcoulombs and 18 meters away is location A and then six more meters away is location B. 
And the story says, if you took a proton and released it from A, so here's a little proton, I'm going to let it go at rest. The question is, how fast would it be going when it gets to B, right? So it's going to be moving along, going pretty quick. And the desire is to try to figure out, well, how fast would it be going? Definitely going to get pushed away from the 3.6. And I want to show you two ways to do this question. And I'm going to be right up front with you and tell you that the first way is absolutely wrong. But I've seen a lot of physics students do it. And so let's talk about it. The first thing they do is they say, oh, well, there'll be a force on it. And they start trying to figure out the force. They go K, Q, Q, all over R squared, back to Coulomb's law. And they find that the force on that charge when it's at location A is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 17 Newtons. Okay, that's if they put in 18 meters for the value for R. Then, they go and say, all right, well, that's the force on it. Let's go and figure out what kind of acceleration you can get. Let's go and do F net is equal to MA, right? So they're going to put that value in for force. And when they do that, they find that the acceleration for that proton ends up being around 9.6 times 10 to the 9 meters per second squared. And maybe you can already see why this isn't going to work. After that, they transition to some kinematics and they say, okay, VF squared is equal to VI squared plus 2AD. And they take that acceleration and they go and they put it in for the A. Now, there isn't even a VI in this story, so they throw that away. And they say, oh, okay, well, VF squared will end up being, you know, 2 times the 9.6, 10 to the 9 times the six meters we're going to go from location A to location B. And they end up with this answer that's it's wrong, and it ends up being 3.4 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. But why is it wrong? And the answer is because that force and that acceleration isn't going to stay the same the whole time. That would only be the force and the acceleration that you'd have right there at A. And as soon as you start to move, even a few centimeters over to here, the force is less. And so that acceleration isn't stable. So instead, what you want to do is you want to do it the right way. You want to go and use conservation of energy. If we do that, if we say, okay, EPI plus EKI plus work, from an elf is equal to EPF plus EKF. That's the way to start this. Now, this story doesn't have any original kinetic energy. We're going to start at A from rest, it said. There's no elf running behind pushing it, maybe one day, but not right now. And there is some potential energy in the end. Be careful. There is a value for EPF, but it's actually quite nice. We'll just go through with the numbers here. So K. I'm going to trust my math, 3.6 times 10 to the negative 6, and a 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 for that proton, all divided by 18 at the beginning. Now, I don't have a lot of room, so I'm just going to word wrap this around and say, okay, on the other side of the equal sign, when you're at location B, you would have some potential energy because you're not infinitely far away. And so that's what's making this problem technically part of next day's material. But we'll just finish this page off. You're not infinitely far away when you're at location B. You can see you're 18 and 6. You're 24 meters away. And then I'm just going to put in here 1 half mass of a proton speed squared. The key thing is not putting all those numbers in. It's just so we can talk about this and say, well, you'd have potential energy both before and after because you're never infinitely far away in this question. And this does give you the right answer. It's not as big as the last answer because the force wasn't as strong as it was at location A the whole time. So the final velocity is impressive, but it's not as impressively big as it was with, um, with the wrong way of doing this question. Okay, so we're going to stop there. There's a worksheet that you can work on where you can practice this, and then we'll finish the worksheet off uh, next lesson, actually, which will be uh, next week.